It's Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers with tips and advice on landscaping and gardening. Here's Fernando Martinez. Hello, hello, and welcome. Glad you could join us today. We've got another good show lined up for you. Today's topic is all about what to do in the springtime. So kind of a um, spring to-do list. I want to go over some things. Uh, We had a question come up about citrus trees, when to prune them. So I thought we would kind of get into uh, the pruning aspects, a little bit of how to prune a citrus tree, when to prune it, and really overall how to get the best out of your citrus trees. And we will go over deciduous fruit trees as well. Uh, Roses. I absolutely love roses. I'm a huge rose fan. Maybe you are too, maybe you're not, but I wanted to uh, talk about them. You, maybe you might find a new love for roses. Uh, so I wanted to go over that, and there's lots to do and a lot of fun, really. I say a lot of, to do, but they're outdoor projects and gardening. You know, for those of us who are into it, it doesn't seem like a chore. It, it seems like we get to go out and prune the roses and get cut flowers and things like that. So I wanted to talk about roses. Also, um, checking the irrigation. I want to talk a little bit about fertilizing. So we've got a lot uh, on the plate here in a short period of time, so I wanted to get right to it. Now, before we do that, though, I want to remind you, if you want to hear this show or any of our other shows, um, we do have a YouTube channel. So you can type in uh, Chaparral Pavers on YouTube, or you can just go to our website at ilovetocomehome.com. And I think on the homepage, if you scroll down there, you'll see uh, it's a picture of me with a microphone here in the studio. You click on that. I think it says radio show on there. And you can, well, there's a link. If you ever want to listen to this show on your mobile device, you can just click on that and it takes you right to KSMA and plays the radio. If it's, you know, at this time, it'll be playing the show on your mobile device but underneath that, there's a archived uh, YouTube videos of all the shows. So you can go there and listen to this show or any of our shows uh, anytime there on the YouTube channel. So check it out. Okay, so let's start off with this kind of a spring to-do list. And it's, you know, spring is a great time to think about the yard and to get out there. The weather starts warming up if we've had rain that year, you know, the plants will all be really watered well, you know, and the soil can be moist. There can be weeds this time of year. Weeds tend to grow more right after the rains, obviously. And so you may be out there cleaning up and thinking about, you know, what to do um, during the springtime in your garden. So pruning, as far as pruning goes, and that's the first topic I want to kind of tackle is it's the last chance to do really hard pruning. And before you can, I want, I mean, I want to say damage to the plant, but not, it's not so much that you're going to damage the plant as much as you might waste the energy that the plant would put out and maybe not get as many blooms or, you know, not have as, as good of a time with your plant material. If you do heavy pruning after spring and if it's not all the way until we get to uh, late fall through winter. So like the whole winter thing, if you, you don't want to prune too much during the winter because you could, it's possible you could stimulate growth and then if new growth because the weather here is it gets crazy sometimes and in the winter time it can be warm and if you just pruned that sometimes the plants will leaf out and think okay it's springtime now and it's still winter and then there could be a frost so really anytime after you know say the second week of march we pretty much don't get frost here in this area you know historically so any, you know, early March, late February, you're going to be okay. The plants aren't going to grow immediately. So even if you pruned them in late February, it's going to take a couple of weeks for the, the new growth to even come out of the plant. But the idea is that you would do it before they send out a flush of growth, before they send out new little buds that will become flowers. And that way you get the whole full experience of that plant and the full bloom and the best, you know, that that plant can look and be. So uh, early, early spring is a last chance for hard pruning and really cutting something back if, if that's what you needed to do or were going to do. 
And even for light pruning, it's a great time to do it because pruning does stimulate growth. And the whole idea in my mind behind maintenance of plants is to go along with what the plant would normally be doing, but in a way that works for us so aesthetically or size wise, you know, however you want the plant to be. But, you know, it's like if the plant isn't growing at all during the winter, you don't fertilize during the winter and try to force it to grow. You know, I want it to be like a reaction to what the plant would normally do in springtime. It would leaf out. That's the time to fertilize right before it leaves out or sends a bunch of buds out is the time to get that hard pruning finished. You can do light pruning throughout the year, obviously, but I'm just, you know, thinking of really shaping things and getting them in order. So it's a great time to do that in the early spring. So let's talk about citrus trees specifically. We had a question on when is it best to prune the citrus? Um, Jill asked the question of her lemon tree. So citrus are evergreen, so they have their leaves year round and they're very bushy. Uh, They're not too tall or too big unless they're really got some age on them. And most of the citrus trees are either semi dwarf or dwarf um, that are purchased and planted here. And it's not a whole lot of full size citrus, which would get quite large. But so for most of us, we either have semi dwarf or dwarf and they're moderately sized, you know, small trees but they grow very dense. Now, I'm just going to say this up front. Plants could care less whether they were ever pruned. It doesn't matter to them. They, well, they would just grow and grow and do whatever. They don't, they don't care if there's suckers coming up from the bottom. But plants, we only prune for our own aesthetic purposes, but we can help the plant breathe a little bit more. We can help it uh, resist insects. Uh, we can help it rubbing branches against each other so that they would do damage to themselves, you know, but the, we're really just pruning for our own aesthetics. So just keep that in mind when you're pruning, prune it the way you want. It's a personal thing. I mean, there's no really way to say, okay, you have to prune this way. And you know, there's, it's gotta be X, Y, and Z. It's, it's totally subjective. And we prune for the shape the, like I said, kind of let air kind of flow through the plant naturally. If it's too heavy on one side and maybe the, the branches are going to break and, and citrus fruit a lot and they get really heavy on some of the branches. So, you know, it's good to, to kind of think about, look at the branch structure, um, kind of from inside the tree, if you can get under there and kind of look at it and see where are the main branches, where are the big strong ones? Focus on those and you can prune out the thinner, weaker ones that don't look as strong or maybe one's kind of growing way off to the side, the left or the right, and could potentially get a bunch of fruit on it, weigh it down, and it looks like it's not going to be able to hold the weight Then get that out of there. Prune it out and prune it away from the main strong branches and give those main strong branches room and let them grow and encourage them to, you know, be the main structure of the tree. And so, um, I, I'll say this too, don't cut more than three to five cuts, especially if they're large cuts, um, without taking a step back. And I mean like 10, 15, 20 feet back and look at the tree and then go up and and look inside the tree and look at the branches and see what's going on. Make a few more cuts, take steps back away from the tree and, and look at it from, the main viewing areas as well. So um, last week's show, we talked about uh, focal points and angles and how things are looking. Once plants are in the ground and established and you've already decided what those focal points are, you ha- you can, you want to keep that in mind as you're pruning, especially bigger things like trees. Go up to the back door or walk up the front. How does the tree look from this angle, from that angle? Again, because we're pruning that to look good for ourselves, not necessarily so much for the health of the tree. So also what I would do is go in there and look for any branches that were rubbing against each other where wind can, you know, cause the branches to move back and forth, back and forth. And if they're touching each other, they'll rub. And if you see any damage, cut those out and just get them out of there. There's easy decisions to make. It's like you're making a bunch of decisions on pruning every time when you go in there, should I cut this one, cut that one. Where do I cut? Do I cut down to the, you know, the nub of the, of the branch or whatever? So, but you really can't 
they make a mistake, go easy on it at first and, you know, take a step back, see what you're doing. Don't take off more than say a third of the tree. Hopefully it's, you don't need to take off any more than that. If you prune once a year, every couple of years, it shouldn't be taking off more than 25% up to maybe a third of, of the tree and that's it. So um, definitely prune regularly, you know, over the, over the years of the course of the tree. So early spring is good. Now it depends on, on, we say citrus like in general, but certain varieties of citrus trees bloom at different times of the year and the fruit sets at, at different times as well. So um, one thing that's interesting is you want to keep an eye on the plant while, when it's flowering. Don't ever prune a citrus tree or prune it heavily while it's blooming or you're going to lose a lot of the fruit. Those flowers become the fruit. So if if you're ever wondering like, wow, I just didn't get as many lemons or oranges this year. It didn't fruit as, as, as heavily as other years. And it's like, why is that? If you watch what happens during the bloom, if it's all of a sudden we get a big windstorm with rain and it damages all the flowers when it's blooming, it's going to affect how it fruits. And, and if those um, flowers get pollinated and turn into little buds and or they're little tiny buds and there's a heat spell and you didn't, you know, up the watering on the sprinklers or whatever and the tree got stressed or, you know, if it's in a container, I see a lot of citrus trees and whiskey barrels and, you know, on the patios and whatnot, which is a great look. But um, if it dried out and didn't get water, if that happened, if it wilted while it was blooming or while the uh, fruit was setting, it's going to affect, you know, how much fruit you get later on in the year. So um, definitely keep an eye on it. So get in there, do your main larger cuts first, and then end with smaller cuts on that uh, citrus tree. And like I said, take out any damaged, um, branches or anything, any weak branches and any branches that would look like they would be long and away from the trunk of the tree and wouldn't be able to support a lot of fruit. Take those off now before they bloom, before they set fruit. If you can do it later, but the trees already spent all that energy and all the nutrients and everything for those branches that you end up cutting off. So it's better to do it early spring. Now, um, so once you kind of get that. And I like to thin them out too, because like I say, they grow really dense. So it's okay to get in there. And if you see three, five, seven branches all clustered together, you know, cut them out of there, leave some space, leave it nice and open. Then you can um, fertilize too. After you're finished pruning, fertilize them and then give them extra water. So absolutely love citrus trees. They do great here on the central coast. I know there's been some issues with bugs and things on them. They can get in there. That's the other thing. If they're having really dense, like we're talking about, the, all those branches clustered together, that's insects love to nest in there. Citrus are susceptible to scale, mealybug, aphids. I mean, there's a lot of snails can get up in there. So, um, But if we get uh, those hiding places out, we let the airflow go through there, Thin them out a little bit, give them a nice shape, focus on the main strong branches, give them some fertilizer, some extra water. You're, you're going to have a really good experience with your citrus tree. Now, what about deciduous fruit trees? There's a lot of deciduous uh, fruit trees here as well that do well here on the central coast. You can prune those in late fall, but if you didn't do it and you don't see any leaves growing yet, you don't see any buds coming out yet, you can still prune in early spring. And it's their last chance before, you know, like I say, the flowers come out or the fruit, you know, starts spending all this energy on, on branches you're going to cut off. So do that. And again, fertilize extra water and man, you just have such uh it's such a difference. It's not really doesn't take a whole long time, you know, to prune a tree or a few trees and it's just well worth it for the whole rest of the year. And um, so deciduous fruit trees, uh, ornamental fruit trees as well. Um, there's a lot of, uh, which is kind of cool. They've got these varieties of trees that don't uh, fruit, but they're fruit trees like ornamental pear, ornamental flowering plums. Um, there's, you know, I, I've, I remember driving through uh, Fox and Woods a couple years ago here in Orchid, and uh, they have ornamental pears on a few of the streets, just lined as street trees and. Man, the beautiful, beautiful white flowers were just gorgeous. 
that doesn't last forever, but you know, I mean, not everything has to bloom year round the whole time. It's just, it seems special when you're seeing them and you see those deciduous fruit trees blooming. It's, it tells you what time of year it is. It's nice to have seasons in that regard. Um, the flowering plums do beautiful here. The beautiful pink flowers, loads of them on the branches before the purple leaves come out. So, you know, it's, it's, I really like them. they they make great additions to our landscape. They help us with height. So yeah, citrus trees, actual deciduous fruit trees and ornamental fruit trees um, are really fun to have and, and easy to work with. And if you prune them early spring, fertilize them, give them extra water, you're going to have a good experience with them. Now let's switch over to roses. I absolutely love roses. Now I, I do get some resistance to them out and you know, when the landscaping world and we're in there landscaping people's homes and when they hear the word roses they think immediately high maintenance and I don't want to do roses and I don't know what experience they've had with them or you know this that you had to be it has to be a rose garden and you have to do this pruning and the bugs and the mildew and the black spot and the aphids but I don't know I mean to me it's there's tons of different kinds of roses so they can mean a lot of different things it doesn't have to always be the hybrid teas, which are the long stem cutting roses, which are great cut flowers. So, I mean, if you can have blooms outside for cut flowers, bring them in the house and enjoy them. We put a vase in our bathroom. Um, it's just, you know, nice to you go in there and you see the blooming. We have one in the, the kitchen island, you know, and, it, and you can actually save money instead of buying the, the cut flowers at the store or whatever. You can just go out in the yard. You can be pruning checking the irrigation, fertilizing, bringing in cut flowers. So let's go over the choices on roses a little bit because it could be as easy as flower carpet roses, which are absolutely amazing. They get virtually no disease, no bugs. They're low growing, low maintenance. So flower carpet roses, absolutely love them. They don't seem to be as popular as they used to be a few years ago. They were coming out in white, pink, red, yellow, and they came in the little two gallon pink pots. Maybe you remember them. I don't see them as much in the nurseries anymore, but I used to plant those a lot. I love to plant those with lavender. So like a low, uh, a low lavender. And then maybe like this hot pink of the flower carpet roses or red with the blue, or you can mix in some whites in there. They're totally carefree, easy plants. And you can have roses in your, you know, in your yard. There's shrub roses which are beautiful. I was going through Trilogy um, the other day and we were looking at some jobs and they had a little park there with a DG pathway and a fountain and the whole way going up were these, uh, what looked to me like either iceberg or white simplicity hedge roses. They call them or shrub roses and they take very little pruning. You don't have to really do a whole lot to them if you want to prune them. Early spring obviously is the best time to do that. And they're just gorgeous. So those two right there between the flower carpet roses and the shrub roses or hedge roses, simple, easy, low maintenance, and you can have roses. Now, of course, if you want hybrid teas, oh man, they're so fun. Maybe, maybe they do take a little bit more maintenance, not extreme. There's Floribundas, hybrid teas, and Grandifloras. The Grandifloras are one of my absolute favorites. They get taller than the uh, hybrid teas. So even along a fence, you can put in a tall uh, grandiflora rose. And this is the time of year to be pruning the roses as well. If you haven't done it in the fall, you haven't cut them back. Now we can get into, you got to cut them back down to, you know, one foot, two feet high. I like to leave mine tall, four or five feet. They're coming back beautifully in the spring with these bright red leaves. Absolutely amazing. The first blooms of the year tells me what time of the season that it is. I don't know. It just, to me, it's, it's, um, these things help. They help me feel really good about my landscape and I'm, I'm have a great time with them. So, okay. When we come back, I want to talk about checking the irrigation and adjusting it a little bit more uh, about fertilizing and then uh, a little bit on uh, some bugs, snails, weeds, and that kind of stuff. Don't forget, go to the website, I love to come home.com. You can listen to these shows anytime on the YouTube channel. There's a link there, or you can just type in um, 
Chaparral Pavers on YouTube. So we will see you right on the other side of the break. You're listening to Patio Side Chat with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers on California's Central Coast. Here on 1240 AM and 99.5 FM, KSMA. This show is brought to you by Airval Block. Concrete paving stones or pavers are not all created equal. Airval block pavers are created from a dry mix of gravel, sand, cement, and color. With very little water used, they're super strong. They won't crack or fade. And to be an Airval block paver, the gravel and sand come from right here on the Central Coast, supporting our local community. Airval block is the only local manufacturer of concrete masonry products like pavers, mortarless retaining wall blocks. Airval Block products are high quality for peace of mind, and there are many colors to choose from. And if you're not sure which products you need or how to use them, you will always get expert advice from the staff at Airval Block. Products made on the Central Coast for the Central Coast. Visit their fully landscaped outdoor showroom to see the many ways you can use Airval Block products at number one Suburban Road in San Luis Obispo. Or go online at airvolblock.com. If you're thinking about installing a new paver patio or paver driveway, check out Chaparral Pavers online at ilovetocomehome.com. Serving the Central Coast since 2001, Chaparral Pavers will work with you to get it right and complete the job to your specifications, as customer service is king at Chaparral Pavers. Paver driveways are stylish and durable and guaranteed to never crack. If your old concrete driveway or entryway is a hazardous cracking mess, it's time to call Chaparral Pavers. Go to their website, ilovetocomehome.com. You'll find all the information you need. Check out photographs of past installations and reviews from Central Coast residents who have used Chaparral Pavers. And don't forget, all installations are guaranteed for the life of your home. So check out Chaparral Pavers online at ilovetocomehome.com. Chaparral Pavers, they'll make you love to come home. Now, back to Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers on KSMA. And we are back. Okay, we are talking about your springtime to-do, your kind of spring cleaning for the yard, and talking about citrus trees and pruning of deciduous fruit trees and even the flowering of deciduous fruit trees, roses. Early spring is the last chance to do the hard pruning. I think that's really the main point of the show. It's a great time to get out there and kind of shape everything, do one last real good uh, cleanup so you're ready. It should last you really through the spring and the summer and into the fall. If you if you do it right, if you do it every year, every couple of years, you shouldn't, shouldn't take a whole lot of work, but it is probably, you know, the bulk of what the gardening pruning and, um, you know, maintenance would have to be done. If you do it this time of year, even uh, grasses, if you haven't cut, qu- cut any uh, deciduous grasses back before the new growth comes up and grows into the dead part of the grass. You know, it kind of looks like, like hay, like this dried out grass. And if you let that, those leaves come up, it's extremely difficult. There's really no way you'll ever get all the dead foliage out of that grass. So give them a short haircut down to two, three inches off down at the ground. I even treat my lion's tail almost like the grasses. I just cut them back way hard and they come up like crazy. Um, they love it, actually. A lot of plants really take well to hard pruning in uh, early spring. So get out there and, and get her done now. So I, I promised we were going to talk about the uh, checking of irrigation and a little bit on, on fertilizing and then some bugs here. So let's get back to it. As far as the irrigation goes, pretty simple. What I'd like you to do is go station by station through your clock and turn them on. Some clocks have a two minute test. If you can, if you're lucky enough to have that, it's really convenient and you can just walk around the yard as the stations are coming on for two minutes each time. Also, uh, if you have a remote control, I know probably less of you have that. I happen to, I put one in at my house. I absolutely love it. I can go station by station and check, um, or worst case scenario, you've got to walk back and forth, um, you know, to the timer to change it. 
and uh, scroll through uh, each station one at a time. So what you're looking for is any leaks. I would check, start at the valves, and as the valve comes on, uh, make sure that it's not leaking out of the valve or look around there for moss or growth or any areas that look wet or damp for, you know, like something's been leaking for some time. Check all the heads. If it's a lawn uh, situation, check the heads for coverage. Check to see if maybe someone's aren't spraying right. Uh, there could be a screen could be clogged. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean something has to be broken and shooting 30 feet in the air. I mean, obviously, if that's going on, you know, get that fixed and save it the water. So, but what you're looking for just some obvious signs or maybe not so obvious if it's just not spraying correctly, you could clean a filter out. I like to, um, when I take the nozzle off, it's usually, it's usually the ones towards the end of the line, furthest away from the valve, maybe the last sprinkler in the end of a run. Um, take the nozzle off, take the screen out, rinse it off at the hose bib with a hose or something, clean the screen out, and then tur- go ahead and turn that valve back on, let water run through that last head before you put the screen back on. That's usually good enough um, for a flush. Drip systems can be high maintenance. They can take a lot of... Um, abuse you know they just sit on the top emitters can pop out things can be leaking if they're buried go around and listen use the sound um you'll be able to spot a leak on a drip system just by being able to hear it also look for snails look for groupings of snails or where they want to gather underneath leaves or in little corners where they can hide from the sun and if you have a snail issue it's a great time to put out the snail bait and address that. Um, if you have known issues with bugs, uh, aphids or mealybugs or scale or whatever, great time to spray early um, before the bugs get established, before the snails start you know, going to town and multiplying. And check for any gopher mounds and see if you see any signs of gophers and start addressing those things right away. And if you do those things in early spring, you're going to set yourself up for a great rest of the spring and a great summer and a nice easy time and have a great time with your landscaping. That's all the time we've got. Go to the website, I love to come home.com. If you want to hear any of these shows, you can check out our YouTube channel. There's a link there on the website, or you can also uh, type in Chaparral Pavers on YouTube. We'll see you next week. This has been Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers. Go to ilovetocomehome.com to find out more or call 805-588-6917. And be sure and tune in next week at this same time for Patio Side Chats here on KSMA.